Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Showcast, the podcast that brings you candid conversations from film festivals and film markets across the globe, presented by The Film Verdict and hosted by yours truly, Matt Micucci. Today we find ourselves amidst the magic and enchantment of the 22nd Transylvania International Film Festival in the beautiful city of Cluj-Napoca in Romania. This festival is renowned for its commitment to nurturing future talents and celebrating new cinematic voices while also paying homage to timeless masterpieces from the past. And speaking of timeless masterpieces, on today's episode, we have a special treat for you. We'll be diving deep into a captivating screening of Todd Browning's remarkable silent film, The Unknown, originally released in 1927. But what made this screening even more extraordinary is the incredible musical accompaniment provided live by two brilliant musicians, Stephen Horn and Martin Pine, joining us on this episode of the Showcast. Prepare to be transported back in time as we explore the intersection of art forms and the art of silent film scoring. Join us as we unravel the secrets behind this unique and captivating experience with two of the greatest exponents of silent film scoring today. And let's not forget about The Unknown itself, a fascinating and intense cult thriller that delves into the world of Amor Fu set against the backdrop of a mesmerizing circus. Starring the legendary Lon Chaney and featuring Joan Crawford in her very first major role, this film is a gem of cinema history. So fire up an audio teeny and listen to the audio waves as they fly through the air. This is the Showcast. First of all, thank you very much for joining us, like I said. Uh, it's great to be here, yeah. Wonderful to be here, thank yeah. you. Well, I'm uh, excited about tonight's screening of uh, the unknown Todd Browning masterpiece, which you guys will be providing the music to uh, with a, an incredible live performance that I would love to talk more about with you. But first of all, as an icebreaker question, this is something that I like to do for these uh, for these podcasts. I like to kind of collect memories a little bit. And since I have foremost musicians in front of me right now and I get a chance to talk about music, I'd love to ask you if there's a specific or certain memory from early childhood from early life that when you think back to it, you realize maybe that's where my journey in music might've come from, might've begun that you could share with us just a memory to break the proverbial ice. <laughs> For me, I was already sort of learning music, but, uh, I think discovering jazz, modern jazz quartet, Miles Davis, I sort of stumbled into that because I like playing tuned percussion, which meant if you were playing in an orchestra, you often got eight bars in the third movement for example, and then I realized that Milt Jackson in the Modern Jazz Quartet got to, he got to play for the whole concert. So then I started buying their records and I got into jazz and that was what made me decide that was, that's what I want to do really from that point on. Purely musically, I think, I can think of two things. I uh, started piano when I was seven and for a few months I hated it and I kept saying to my mother, um, I want to stop. And she made a bargain with me. She said, stick it out for six months and if you still hate it, you can stop. And at some point around the five month mark, something clicked and I fell in love with it and I couldn't stop after that. Yeah. So thanks to my mother for making me stay for six months. And then the other thing was, uh, I was in a choir, a church choir for until my voice broke and I'm completely secular, non-religious, but there were times singing where I would be transported because I, even then at that young age, I knew I was not religious. I knew that that was music that was doing it, not God. <laughs> Right. I'm curious what made you, uh, what made that click happen, as you put it? Was there a particular type of music? We spoke about jazz, uh, but uh, was there any particular tune or music or artist? No, well, I was a real classical nerd for the first few years. My training was classical. And then um, what opened me up, <laughs> bizarrely enough, was the Beatles' Abbey Road album. We had a lodger. He said, you know, you have to not just listen to classical. And he played me the second side medley of Abbey Road. Right. If you know, if you know that. Side long. That's, yeah. yeah. And I was like, yeah, that was a kind of uh, a changing point. And then I started listening to everything. Yeah. So. Beatles tend to be quite a popular choice when people talk about what was the band that kind of inspired you to become a musician, regardless of the genre that people, mm. uh, you know, work within. Or It's interesting. Sort of surprisingly radical. Oh, yeah. yeah. Timeless. Yeah. Timeless. Completely contemporary to this day. It's it's incredible. Yeah. Skipping ahead, obviously, jumping ahead. When did you realize that silent films <laughs> was a viable option for music? Because 
you know, speaking with people who are sort of involved in organizing silent film related events and uh, even connoisseurs, historians, up to not too long ago, a few decades ago, you know, silent films were, were almost ignored, even sort of laughed at. They were outdated. They're kind of strange, odd. Of course, that isn't completely not true. But like regarding your sort of journey, when did that, you know, when did you have that awakening that perhaps this is an area that I could uh, work within? Well, the very first example for me, I was just hired by a composer who'd written some music for silent films. So in I got to play with silent films. So that was very much play. Everything was written down. And usually I had my back to the screen, so I didn't get to actually watch the film. But then I was sort of around the films and seeing them. I was also working a lot with dance. I play a lot. We both actually play mm. with a contemporary dancer. So I was used to working with movement and collaborating and mm. improvising. And then I think we met in that context and started talking mm -hmm. about it. Stephen was already working as a solo pianist with film and we we both were interested in film and we thought, well, we ought to do something sometime and eventually something came up where we did. So it, to a certain extent for me to begin with, it was an, an extension of the way I improvise on percussion with dancers because it was moving images mm -hmm. and, you know, that was the starting point for me, I, I think, yeah. Yeah, I mean aside from how I got into silent film specifically, that that's an interesting thing is a lot of silent film musicians are also dance accompanists. And mm. I think it's it can't be a coincidence because like you, I, I accompany dance very in a very visual way. I'm not sort of thinking about, you know, this is Ron de Jean, you know, this is, it's all kind of just looking at them and finding the tempo of the dance. There's this kind of weird parallel to finding the tempo of a film. Mm. You know, good films have a tempo. Right. It's obviously stretch over a much uh, longer period of time. But obviously you have to have a specific vocabulary to do that, right? Because I'm sure that that's something that many musicians would find difficult to do. Perhaps people who are primarily experts at reading music, you know, so you have to be able to... Improvisation itself is tricky. Well, there's so many different ways that it can be done and has been done. But specifically for me, while I was studying music, I was always a film buff. Mm. You know, I probably saw more films than attended concerts. And during my training, I did see some silent films, but always with recorded music, never with live music. Right. Was there any particular music from a film that you remember sort of stirring your soul or inspiring you in some way? Not really. I mean, a bit like you. I mean, my first experience of silent film was someone asking me to do a job. You know, mm. it's so it I'd like to say it was some big sort of moment of the soul. But um, I had a teacher from my old school was like a local film buff and she used to run film societies. And she remembered a, a school that I used to play pe my compositions mm. and bore people, everyone. She said, oh, I'm showing this silent film to my local group. Could you come along and just make some music up? And that film was The Passion of Joan of Arc. Oh, wow. She came to my house and she projected one reel onto my white wall. And I was, wow, that's not was what I was expecting. <laughs> and then I played for the film and... Uh, having only seen that first 15 minutes and then the rest was improvised, seeing it for the first time with an audience. And then I wrote to um, the BFI South Bank, which at the time was the National Film Theatre, saying how experienced I was at accompanying silent film and could they give me a chance. Yeah. And they gave me an audition and that was 35 years ago. See, that's a film where you have to interact with a close-up for a lot of it. So does that... Uh... It was a hell of a one to start, start oh, with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> baptism of fire. Let's try and it's, that, that fascinates me. So do you have to sort of try to establish an emotional report with the performance, which is fascinating in itself because it's a performance that's almost a hundred years uh, ago, that, from a hundred years ago from now. It's a sort of collaboration in a it's sense. You're, you're trying to collaborate with these old, these yeah. old artists who have made this thing and you're trying to mm -hmm. interact with what they've done. So yeah. it becomes a sort of dynamic living thing. Yeah. And in a sense, I think maybe the music can help it become a, a living thing rather than this sort of artifact from the past. You know, you can you can sort of bring it to life, hopefully. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, the way I, starting at the BFI so long ago, in those days, there was no internet. There wasn't even DVD. And it was very hard. To, they did not have in their schedule the mm. ability to show the musicians the films beforehand. So for about the first 10 years, every live show I did, was for a film I hadn't seen before. Ah. So all I could do was write, read the few notes, which would usually be about restoration or something completely unhelpful. 
but I would have an idea of genre maybe, you know, I would know it was a Western or a comedy. Yeah. So I would maybe sort of do some preparation in that regard. But yeah. So yeah, I was going to mention that. Do you have to have some type of a preparation beyond the musical, you know, sphere that's more related to drama, to, to theater, to film in terms of genre, in terms of certain types of conventions? Yeah, it's an interesting thing. I think it's good to be aware of conventions. And I think as musicians, it's probably important to have a, a broad frame of reference so that you can pull ideas from lots of different places mm. rather than just being stuck at, well, this is the music I do, you know. I do techno or I do jazz or I do, and I'm just going to do that regardless of the film. For me, you'd want to better pull on different elements. So I have that frame of, oh, this might be right for this film. But there's also decisions to be made. Are you going to do something that's very tied to the film in terms of era and image, or are you going to do something that's more contemporary sounding, but that you feel you can make work yeah. with the film? You know, that's an interesting thing to think about, you know, because some people, some people would get upset if I was using a hi-hat on the drums right. on a film that was made before a hi-hat was invented. Yeah. Um, you know, so some people will have very strict views on that. They would hate the more, you know, modern soundtracks that some artists are providing. And, and sometimes I do talk, speak with some sound film enthusiasts and, and they do hate it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's, I think that's just been an, on, an ongoing debate. And yeah. I think sometimes you hear something that you just think, oh, I wish they hadn't done that. Mm. I think sometimes you see people who you feel they're just trying to do a gig mm. with a film on. They're just trying to play their gig with their music with the film on behind them. That's not what I, or I think, or Stephen would particularly mm -hmm. want to do. I always want to work very much with the film. If I'm going to do a gig of my stuff, I'll just do a gig of my stuff. Yeah. You know? I guess probably nominally traditional, you know, having a classical background and playing for ballet as well as contemporary dance, and that helps that. And I'm very aware of the history of the music that accompanied films during the era that they were made. And I'm very aware that there are certain people who think you should only play in that idiom. Anything beyond that is sort of just, you know, like a disgrace. But I'm very much of the never say never school of thought. Right. I'm not even against people doing a gig, but I think as long as you're not pretending it's anything else other than that. Say, you know, a band mm -hmm. is doing what it does and they think, oh, let's show us our film. As long as it's sold to the audience as essentially a gig rather yeah. than a film show at a film festival. Yeah. For example, just a personal opinion, you know, I have attended uh, screenings of silent films with more modern scores. And to me, my, the impression is that it's more, more often than not, it, it kind of tends to age the film, but make the music sound very, very cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but, but it, sometimes it's been done really, really respectfully and that that has worked. But then again, I have also attended, you know, more traditional sort of uh, scores. And I think that was when the musicians weren't particularly fond of the movie itself, which is another variable yeah, that I've always yeah, considered yeah, yeah, quite true. interesting. Yeah. Again, it is it's also, it depends on the film itself. Yeah. Like cool. I think performance for tonight's film will probably be yeah. a bit more modern than right. with certain other films because just the nature of the film, it's so weird and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and full on. And it's kind of like, you know, if David Lynch had made a silent film, yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I think it's a film that can sustain a bit of push and pull musically in a way that, you know, Douglas Fairbanks' Washbuckler wouldn't, you know. Let's talk about it a little bit more then, because Todd Browning is a fascinating uh, filmmaker. It's too restrictive to say what people have called him, sort of a pioneer of the horror genre. I think he's a visionary that goes well beyond the conventions of horror, although he did help establish a lot of the conventions of horror films. And yes, I do see the, the, the link with uh, David Lynch to The Unknown is uh, one of his silent films. Perhaps, strangely enough, not one of his best known works. Uh, certainly not more famous than uh, Freaks or uh, Dracula, but definitely a fascinating one. But yeah, how did it sort of begin uh, for you guys, this, this journey in uh, the unknown, into the unknown? <laughs> well, it was just a booking, really. You know, we were invited to play by the woman who program silent film at the Barbican in wow. London. And she chose that they have a kind of collaboration with the annual London Festival of Mime. So each year they'll program a silent film because obviously mime is, silent film is a, is a form of mime. Right, yeah. um, and I think probably because the expressiveness of the acting in this film mm -hmm. is so sort of um, full on, 
that it's, it was a good choice for a mime festival. So that was it, really. I had played for it a few times as a soloist, but not for several years. But this is the first time that we will play for the restored film, the recent restoration. Just seen the new footage yeah. today. <laughs> okay, so this is a recent, re- the first time recent restoration. So what are the differences actually between the two, the older version and the new restoration? Because I heard there also there's different duration. Am I, am I right? It's, 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 it's about 10 minutes longer. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so there's there's a bit more detail in early in the film. So the scenes feel a bit more like scenes, I think mm. we were saying, early on in the film where things are being set up and some, some things maybe make a little bit more sense mm. in terms of the sort of narrative in the first part of the film. I mean, it looks much better and much smoother as well, right. in a sense. It looks fantastic, actually. Yeah. After yes, it's maybe less choppy because of the, there's obviously not things that were missing before. Mm. So... In some ways, I think that's going to make it a little bit easier to play with because sometimes if things are jumping and you've, you've got to figure out, are we going to go with every jump or are we going yeah. to play through them? You know, there's all those things which you have to make. They're decisions which I guess you tend to make very quickly and intuitively. Your brain is always uh, thinking about that. And when there's two of you, there's two yeah. of you to think. You know, yeah. yeah. But let's talk more about that, actually, because obviously when it comes to um, scoring films or sound films, especially at a live event, there's, there's a couple of, you know, ways in which that is done from the completely improvised to the through composed. So where does this sort of music that, that we're going to hear tonight fall into, does it fall into a category or does is it kind of a hybrid of the two? I would call it prepared improvis- improvisation. For the Barbican, we, we prepared a, a few sections of notated music, but that was for the previous version. One thing we have to decide today, actually, during our discussions today is whether we use that or whether we start again. But you know, even if you just see the film once, you've obviously you start to prepare in your mind. So I think we will have you know a handful of melodic themes and harmonic progressions, but it will be the compositional aspect is more to do with pre- preparing what we do when because we also play a variety of instruments. So it'd be like, well, this would be good with this combination. This would be good with a solo. When you say variety of instruments, what uh, what sounds are we talking about then? Well. I mean, hopefully, drum kit, hopefully vibraphone. I've got. We're going to go along and see what they've got. So, I mean, that's another factor. I don't know exactly what the drum kit is. Right. I've sent some things. This is what I'd like, but I don't quite know what it, it won't be. My drums. So, obviously, what do these sound like? Also, what do they sound like in the room? Because so you're playing the acoustic of the space you're in. Some yeah. things you play in a certain room that sound great might sound horrible in yes. another room, whether, you know, whether it's reverberant or very dry. There's all those sort of things to think about. So yes, there's going to be a few decisions to sort of make just based on what they've got, you know, I'm, well, I'm sure they've got the stuff. I think there's an academy of music just, just across the road. <laughs> yes, I think we walk past that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Actually, yes, you bring up a good point. The, the, we talked about uh, the music in the film, but then there's another component to it that I, that I kind of wanted to ask you about because, well, we, we mentioned the location as well. That's obviously really, really important in terms of getting the right sounds the right vibes. But then, of course, there's the audience too. So I'm thinking, do you feel that presence while you during a performance? And how does it impact that performance, especially when we're talking about perhaps films that are from a long time ago and an audience that has maybe never seen a film from that even comes to that close period uh, of a period of time, you know, so... Do all of these factors kind of come into play? Yeah. Well, I, mean, I suppose audiences are different. Like, as you say, sometimes you'll be playing people who will not have watched this sort of thing at all. Mm. Sometimes you might be playing where it's an audience of people who are just obsessed with silent films and they, mm. yes. you know, and they will have very strong opinions. So, yeah. <laughs> so that's quite... Yeah, I was going to ask you, which one is worst? <laughs> no, no, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> Let's not get into that. <laughs> yeah. I, think, um, I mean, the hyper-academic audience can be a bit challenging. Um, but you never get them like booing you or anything, you know, they might say nasty things afterwards, but, um, but equally the the audience who laughs at the film Mm. can be challenging. Um, You mean when it's, they're not intended to. Yes. Like if they think, oh, you know, this is just ridiculous and Mm. they've, they've, you know, they think they've come for, you know, almost like the equivalent of a a guilty pleasure, like, you know, a so bad it's good kind of film, but that happens very rarely. So you do feel protective towards it in a way. Very much so, yeah. Uh Yeah. I mean, this film does get some laughter, but it's sort of in the um, 
uneasy laughter sort of country. Yeah. It's because it is funny, it's, but it's funny peculiar. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I think that are very obviously deliberate, like where the main character has uh, his arms taken off and she says, um, his romantic um, partner says, uh, have you lost some weight? And he says, I've just lost a little flesh. Yeah, exactly. You know, that's, <laughs> you know, that's meant to be funny. Yeah. Do you feel that during a performance and does it impact it? Like, you know, just this feeling of, uh, is the audience paying attention to it now? Are they leaning a little closer to the screen because they're bored or like? I think you sense a bit of that sometimes if you, mm. if you've got something really magical and that you, that you can get that sense of hush sometimes. Mm. Obviously, sometimes if there's laughs at the right place, that's a very direct yeah. feedback. Mm. I mean, varies from audience to audience. We did one performance where people were, sh- it almost became like a jazz gig. There were people sort of shouting and oh. cl- in a good way, you know. Mm. It was for like, a film, for a film. Yes, yes, yeah, there was one, but we had, a, <laughs> we had a solo sort of drum bit for a big industrial scene and the, oh. there was all this sort of shout, you know, oh, well, that's never happened before. But, I mean, but it was nice. Yeah, you know, they applauded at the end, you know, yes. in the middle of what a film. What was the film? Was it City Symphony or? No, uh, Fragment of an Empire. Fragments of an empire. Yeah. yeah, that was also great because um, the way we structured that score. Do you know the film? I don't know the film so, actually. No, it's the story of a, a Bolshevik okay, so soldier Bolshevik. who has amnesia. He's from the uh, Tsarist yeah. time. He loses his memory during the Tsarist regime. Wakes up in the Grand Bolshevik New Reality, and so we start the score with the, uh, the Tsarist national anthem and end with an with the Internationale. Ah, and the score during this film, the two anthems sort of gradually yeah. transform. That was the overarching philosophy behind the score. You're interpreting. You, yeah. don't, you don't have a pointer. That's that. That that was not originally intended. Oh, but no, you're no. creatively bringing your kind of input. But it comes from the film in that it film, ends yeah. with main character looking at the camera and yeah. saying, "We all have to fight for a better Bolshevik future." But on that event, the audience stood up and sang along. So it's a Russian. So it's a Soviet production from yeah. twenty. That's a propaganda. Uh, for drummer, is that simulating to work in a Soviet montage uh, theory? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, it was like, you know, yes, the growth of Soviet industry. Yes, I yeah. 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 So Stephen said, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to stop playing in this bit. So you know, that's going to be... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. fascinating. Set piece, yeah. <laughs> well, guys, I'm looking forward to tonight's uh, performance and tonight's concert event. Uh, so thank you very much for, for joining us and talking with us about it and more. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. It's been great. That's great. And that brings us to the end of another captivating episode of the Showcast. We hope you enjoyed our exploration of the Transylvania International Film Festival and the mesmerizing world of silent film. A special thank you to Stephen Horn and Martin Pine, the maestros behind the live musical accompaniment for the screening of Todd Browning's The Unknown. Their talent and expertise truly brought the magic of silent cinema to life. Remember, the power of cinema knows no boundaries, whether it's nurturing emerging talents or revisiting and preserving timeless classics. Stay tuned for more candid conversations, behind-the-scenes stories and unforgettable moments from film festivals and film markets worldwide on future episodes of the Showcast. Till the next time, this is Matt Mikuchi signing off. For The Film Verdict, see you soon.